Gospel of John, chapter 18, verse 33 through 37. We can just... You can use our regular version that we use. If you have it, say amen. If you're still looking for it, it's the fourth book of the New Testament. John 18 and 33 through 37, we also have it on the board. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoning Jesus, and he asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Hmm. Jesus answered him and said, do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replies, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and your chief priests, they've handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered him and said, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom was from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. So Pilate asked him and said, so you are a king. Jesus answered him and said, you say that I am a king for this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. And everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Hmm. I want to talk to you this morning about honoring the king. Honoring the king. So in our world... There are many forms of government, from the most restrictive to the most liberal, seemingly liberal. We have dictatorship, which nobody likes, because in that form of government, if you're living in a society where you have a dictator, you have a leader who holds the power, and he has few to no limitations. That's scary. On one end of the spectrum, you have that, and that seemed most horrible. And then on the other end, besides the dictatorship, you have what we say is the best form of government here in the United States, which we so-called go to around the world to try to implement in other nations, and that is democracy. This democracy is seen as or defined as giving men the most freedom or power because the power is vested in the people. This is the type of government that so-called is supposed to respect everybody's rights and freedoms and allow for individual expressions. The people are ruling, so they say. Then we have things like communism, which is not a major form of government, but we have it in our world where basically It's a state-run society, a classless society, and they determine where you work, and they determine where you live, and how much money you should get, and the state is basically controlling everything. Or you may have a socialist government, right? That's a form of government where actually socialism has to do with there's private versus public. So it's really where the state or the government owns most of the social public uh, uh, manufacturing and things of that nature. It's not as much allowed to have private ownership of such of those things. They say this is a better form of government because it will help everybody in the long run. Then you have a republic, which is not too much different than a democracy because a republic Supposedly, the power rests with the public people and their representatives. And really, the broad definition of a republic is any government where there is not a single person in charge. Her rules. Then lastly, and we've talked about this before, we have this form of government that we, are, we call monarchy. It's the oldest form of government in the world. It's still seen in some places around the world. In a monarchy, one person is the ruler of a society or a nation or a territory as long as that person lives. 
Normally, this person who was in charge of what everybody else is seen as royalty, sacred, as if God had given them that right to rule, ordained them to rule the people. This is opposite of a dictator who's a ruling because usually a dictator is a leader who have made himself the ruler versus in a monarchy where you have a king or a queen or a prince or a princess or a royal family, they are acknowledged and recognized by the people as those who they want to rule them. So there is a difference between the two. One is forced, the other is recognized. <laughs> it is the form of government, a monarchy, we will look at today more particularly because it's the closest to what represents God, our creator in heaven. So in a monarchy, you have a kingdom and you have a king. And the king is the ultimate or absolute authority and ruler over a domain or a territory. And it was his job, if he was the king or ruler, two main jobs he had was to protect the citizens that were under his care, okay, to protect them. And also his other job was to establish and keep order, make laws, implement societal uh, parameters and boundaries and things that he wanted the people under his rule to live by. And so the people look to this king for the security. They look to this king to put rules in place because they wanted to have a good life. And the king was the greatest influencer, and this is why people Wanted, if, when you, especially when you look at the Old Testament, when they said, oh, no, we're going to make him the king. Why did they want to make him the king? Because usually this was a person who led the people in defeating their enemies. And so they wanted that person to be their judge, that person to be their king, that person to be their leader, because that is the job of a king or a leader is to provide security for the people. And if we trust you to, to, to protect us and to make sure that we're secure, we also trust you to put and implement laws in place whereby we can live. People always were looking for someone who could command their respect, someone who they would be willing to follow, someone who would lead them. So more than that, I want to turn our attention not so much from what the king in his kingdom, what his responsibility was, as much as I want to look at the responsibility or the actions or the behaviors or the operation of the people who were under his leadership. How did they deal with their king? How did they treat him? How did they respond to him? What was their actions? If we look at it through history, if we look at it through scripture, what are the actions of the citizens of a kingdom under a king? And we see that these people looked at their king like he was what we would call today a celebrity. That's our king. He's amazing, isn't he something? People placed him above others. He was always given, he's the king, right? The preferential treatment above anybody else. He was given the best of everything. We can't, now, we can't be eating the best, and our king's not eating the best. We got, the king has to eat the best. The king has to look the best. The king has to dress the best. The king has to have everything that's the best. I can't be in marble-walled houses, and my king is in wood stucco houses. My king has to have the best of everything. Hmm. The people gave him the best. The people also were totally subservient and obedient to their king. Well, you know, there's always some people in the kingdom 
that want to do a coup. There's always some people that's a little rebellious. There's always going to be that. But the majority, for the most part, for peace and order, the people were obedient to the king, and he had servants, and even the citizens made sure if the king, if they had something that the king needed or wanted, automatically it was given to them, to him, because he's the king. So he had total obedience. The people didn't mind being taxed by the king to collect money for his own personal projects or the projects he wanted to do for his kingdom. The king was a royal presence. He was like sacred. Sometimes people wouldn't even look at him because that would disrespect the king. He was a man who lived in luxury. Now watch this. In dealing with the king, this is how the people approached him. When they spoke to him, they referred to him not, what's up, bro? Hey, dude. They didn't call him by his first name or last name. This is the king, your royal highness. Your majesty, your grace, you, you, great ruler, great king. They addressed him with honor. They addressed him as one who deserved to be addressed that way because of his position. When they came before him, not only did they speak a certain way, they bowed before him. In honor and respect, they bowed before him. Some even kissed his hand and kissed his ring to pay homage and honor to him because he's our king. And this is the way that you treat a king. They also gave gifts. They never, nobody ever came in front of a king or presented themselves to a king without something in their hand to give the king. They always had an offering. They always had a sacrifice. They always had a gift to give to their king. How dare I ever show up before my king without having something to give him, to let him know how much I like him, thank him, honor him, thank God for him. I'm not going to do it. They also gave other gifts, finances, rooms, clothing. And I was thinking about this. You know, sometimes I was thinking about my nephew who called me. Uh, anybody who knows me knows my favorite color is royal blue. That color blue right there. Take note of it. I know Christmas is coming up. I'm just playing. I'm just playing. <laughs> Uh, but I love royal blue. So years ago, I had bought this royal blue satin shirt. One of, it was my favorite shirt. And I had it. I've had it for a few years. I look forward to, you know, wearing it from time to time. Sitting in my closet. I'm like, yeah, that's my shirt. My nephew called one day, and a friend of his in high school, young, had died, and all of the kids were going to dress up in her favorite color, which was royal blue. He didn't have a royal blue shirt, so he said, hey, Unc, I remember you have a nice royal blue shirt. You think I could use that or borrow that shirt? I was thinking to myself, you ain't getting my shirt. I'll help you go, let's go to the store. I'll help you find one, but you ain't getting that one, right? And I heard the Lord talk on my heart. He said, give him this shirt. He's like, I'm, gonna give, I'm just going to wear it. I'm going to give it back. So I was thinking, okay, cool. He's going to give it back. And something said, he ain't going to give it back. And the Lord was like, give him the shirt. I was like, Lord, he's not going to give it back. He said, that's okay. Give him the shirt. Don't expect it back. He's asking to borrow it, but I want you to give it to him. And I was thinking to myself, God, all these shirts in my closet, and you want me to give him my favorite one, right? And so sometimes, <laughs> we're not even talking about a king. The Lord is just saying, this is your nephew, but I just want you to release it and give it to him, right? I thought about the story of how, and it just hit me. This morning, I was thinking about how Jacob made a coat for Joseph, a coat of many colors, 
a robe, which his brothers, of course, were jealous about. He had had dreams that he was going to be a ruler. And I started thinking, and I was like, Jacob didn't, the Bible doesn't say that Jacob received any dream or sign or God spoke to him about what Joseph was ultimately going to be. Even when Joseph told him the dreams, he was like, me and your mom's going to submit under your rulership? Is that actually going to happen? But somehow in the spirit, he made this coat for, for Joseph, which represented where Joseph was going. Because ultimately, Joseph was going to be favored, and he was going to wear a royalty robe that represented his position. And even as a young boy, God was trying to tell him something through his father, who made a coat or a robe for him and gave it to him. But as a king, they would give these gifts. And the last thing they would do is they never went before a king any kind of way. They didn't dress. They didn't put on Levi's. And I mean, when they came before a king, they didn't have Levi's back then, but they didn't smell bad. They didn't look bad. They, didn't, they had to go. They cleaned up. You could not present yourself in front of a king any kind of way. If that is a king and you respect that person as your king, you would never show up before him smelling, tore clothes, looking crazy, or any of that. You always prepared yourself. Always there was preparation before you came into the presence of a king. Next week is part two. I'm going to talk about preparation more. They understood these people in history, these people in the Bible who had an earthly king. They understood honor and the highest regard and respect. Someone who was in a high position, God-ordained position on the earth. We give honor to this person. We give them the best. And as we transition from this idea, I want us to look at our own lives. Because as the people who have now given their lives to Jesus Christ, we belong to a spiritual kingdom. We have a king who is greater than any earthly king. We operate in a kingdom outside of any in this world. Somehow, though, in our relations to God, too many do not have the respect for the creator and giver of life. Even many believers in Jesus Christ, who is the king of kings, they would disrespect him in the way that they go about living their life. Hmm. This message came about because I was in prayer a few weeks ago and I heard the Lord speak to me. And he told me, I want you to teach my people about honoring me. My people do not truly honor me as their king. They don't value me enough to give me their very best. They are careless. Too many times, I'm not put first. I'm put second, third, fourth. What's important to me, God cried out to me, is not important to them. I'm not a priority. I'm not worth the sacrifice in their opinion. I'm ignored. I'm treated as a common regular, not a big deal. I'm not honored. Worldly things are allowed to interrupt the relationship they have with me at any time. I am worshiped based on their convenience. And when they do worship me, there's little to no passion. Little recognition, little focus. I am kept waiting so many times. He said, ask the question, how do you honor me as a king? How should you treat me, God says, as, a, as your king? It should be much greater than any earthly king. There's a term that we use called royal treatment. Anybody ever received royal treatment? 
It's the manner of action toward someone who you deem is suitable uh -huh, because they are a very important person. Royal treatment, when I give you the royal treatment, I'm doing something for someone who is deserving of what is elaborate and worthy of all of this attention. We can't really understand what we need to do as the people of God living on this earth in this area when it comes to honoring our king and giving him what he deserves, this royal treatment. We can't really understand this without revelation, without vision, without a pattern that has to be given to us, showing us how things are supposed to operate, how God intended for his kingdom citizens and servants to operate in his kingdom in regard to him who is our king. So heaven has always been the example for the people of God on this earth. That's why in the prayer, Jesus says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is, just like it is in heaven. What God wants on the earth from us can be seen when we look at what's happening in heaven. We not only get a glimpse of what should be, but we also get a glimpse of what will be. <laughs> God's perfect will is already done, and it is completed. It is finished in heaven. It will one day be matched on the earth in its fullness at the very end. And those who will not or choose not to are continually insist on not obeying and honoring God's will, the Bible says, will be cast out. And they will live with those who choose not to cooperate with God's perfect will. So if heaven is our pattern for what God expects from us who are in his kingdom, let's look at closely Heaven to see what we're supposed to be doing. Heaven is the perfect kingdom. When we live down here, we are rehearsing for eternity. We are preparing ourselves for heaven. Anybody getting prepared for heaven? Does your life look like you're preparing for heaven? Does your actions look like that you are preparing to spend eternity with God? <laughs> Don't say nothing. <laughs> so how do we relate to our king? There are seven things that we are given based off the pattern in heaven regarding how we should function and behave and act when we're relating to our king, who is the king over all kings. And he is the king of kings. He has been given all power, all authority in heaven, in earth, and under the earth. <laughs> Here are seven things we're going to look at. The first thing we're going to look at is praise. Praise. Other words we use... Uh, that is close to this is proclamations and declarations and making affirmations, but praise. And praise is when we speak well about someone. Praise is we are boasting about someone. We are mentioning to everyone about his positive qualities and attributes. Have you, have you, God is good. God is great. God is a way maker. God is awesome. God can do anything. He's the God of impossibility. Right now, I'm praising him. I'm mentioning him. I'm boasting about him. I'm talking about him. I'm telling you who he is. 
I'm bragging about him. I'm sharing with you. I'm making him known. I'm revealing to you. It's to let others know about who he is, how he is, what he is, and what he does. Watch this. And we miss our blessing too many times because blessings, God can move on in this earth to bring about your blessings at any moment or any second. I want you to, man, this is good. Could it be that there were times that God was trying to release a blessing, but because you weren't in the right place at that time, because you saw your blessings coming on a Sunday morning, you saw your blessings when you get to prayer, but God wanted to bless you when you were standing at Walmart. God wanted to bless you when you were sitting down at work. God wanted to bless you when you was putting gas in your car. God always is looking for an opportunity to bless you. And so we got to stay, God. We got to stay in an atmosphere, in an attitude of praise. Because when you're in praise and you're constantly in worship continually, then you, you set the atmosphere for wherever you at on whatever given day at whatever given time for God to release a blessing in your life. And so praise is us talking about God. It's mentioning God. It's telling people about God. And the problem is we talk too much about ourselves. And God is wanting to release a blessing from heaven. He wants the kingdom on earth to come in the midst where you're at, but you're saying the wrong things. So we're... Miss our blessing because we talk too much about ourselves when we should be talking about the Lord. We're talking too much about the world and things in the world. What if we changed our conversation and we talked about him mostly? We'll watch him come in, God, because the scriptures say he inhabits the praises of his people. God. At any time, at any moment, he, he enters, he dwells, he, he lives in the praises of his people. So when I'm praising him, I'm thinking about him, I'm praying, I'm worshiping him. At that moment and at that time, I give him space to do what he wants to do in my life. And how many of us want God to do more in our lives so we can switch we can turn the switch and we can begin to understand the power of continually praising the Lord. <laughs> and when we do this, <laughs> we are following the pattern of heaven because praise is continual in heaven. Praise never ends in heaven. It's 24-7. They don't stop praising the Lord. The creatures around the throne, the elders around the throne, everybody is constantly speaking, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Praise continually. This is what, what, what David was talking about when he said, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make a boast in the Lord, and the humble thereof shall be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. God. Jesus. This is what praise will do. Let's stop and praise him right now. Exalt the Lord with me. Come on, exalt the Lord with me, and let us exalt the Lord with me. Praise him with me. Glorify him with me. Lift him up with me. Something's going to happen in your life. Something's going to turn around in your situation. God's about to move in your situation. We praise you. We praise you. Hallelujah, God. Woo! Give your king praise. Give your king praise. Your king deserves praise. Our king deserves praise. 24 hours, seven days a week. We can't praise him enough. Simon said, if I had 10,000 hands, that wouldn't be enough. If I had 10,000 tongues, that wouldn't be enough. 
That's how worthy he is. That's how deserving he is. That's how great our king is. Mm. Hebrews 13 and 15 says, through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to our God. That is the fruit of our lips that acknowledge his name. Continual praise, continual offering from the fruit of our lips. Mm. So the first thing that heaven shows us about how we should honor our king is it gives us an understanding of the importance of praise. Praise is critical, it's significant when it comes to our king. The second thing heaven shows us is worship. <laughs> praise and worship. Some of you guys say, what's the difference between the two? Praise is when I tell you about him, but praise is when I tell him about him. Yeah. Praise is external, but worship is internal. Praise is outward, but worship is intimate. <laughs> And what we find in heaven is not only is praise happening at all times, worship is going on. That they praise him, they, they shout and proclaim him in the heavens so that the angels can hear and the elders can hear and the people around the throne can hear and everybody can hear. But at some point of praising him, they begin to worship. And instead of saying, holy, holy is our God, they say, holy, holy are you, O Lord. Great are you, O oh God. It shifts. <laughs> when I worship now, I'm giving of myself personally. When I worship, I'm giving of my heart to God. I'm talking to the Lord. I'm sharing with him my innermost heart. I'm crying out before him. I'm letting him know how much I need him. I'm letting him know how much he means to me. I got a revelation for you couples. Sometimes we're in trouble in our marriage because we don't know how to praise one another. <laughs> Praising one another means this is my wife. She's beautiful, isn't she? This is my husband. He's a, he's a, he's a wonderful man. He's a strong man. This is, this is, this is my, my honey bun. I can't, she's my better half. You know, all that good stuff. We need to practice praising our mates. That's where it starts. Watch this. And we need to practice in a, I'm going to say it in a quote unquote right way, worshiping our mates. Now, this is what I mean by that. Worship is intimate, right? Watch this. You can't get pregnant if you don't get intimate. That means in a relationship, you got to go beyond talking about how beautiful your wife is, and at some point, you've got to show some kind of love and affection. You got to move into an area Right, right, where it's, it's, it's personal, just between you two, so she can get pregnant, so she can receive, God, this is so good, watch this, spiritually, there are many people who are walking around saying, I don't have a purpose, I don't know what God wants me to do. I, my life doesn't seem to have any meaning. I don't have any destiny. Watch this. I dare you to go into worship. Because you cannot go into worship with God and he not impregnate you with vision. You cannot go into not worship with God and he not birth something in you. Your problem is not that you need somebody to counsel you and tell you what you do. Your problem is you haven't learned how to worship. 
Because in worship, you will get pregnant with destiny. In worship, you will get pregnant with vision. In, 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 in worship, you will get pregnant by God. He will put something in you that you can't help. You got to do it. You got to move on it. You got to walk in it. You got to live by it. <laughs> Some of us, God, some of us are spiritually barren because we haven't learned how to worship. Come on, take a few minutes to just worship him with me. Father, we worship you. Talk to him from your heart. God, I worship you, Lord. God, I worship you in spirit and in truth. God, you are my God. You are my way maker. You are the love of my life. God, I can't do nothing without you. God, I'm, I'm in intimate with you, personal with you. You, I'm giving you my heart, God. You have my heart. You're the only one I need. You're the only one I call on. You're the only one I trust in. God, you're the one. You're the one. You're the one. I glorify. You're the one I lift up. God, here I am, me and you, God. Hallelujah. I love you, Father. I love to be in your presence. I love you when you hold me. I love you, love it when you speak to me. I love it when you download into me. I love it, God. I worship you. I worship you. I worship you. I worship for who you are, for who you are, for who you are. To me, to me, to me, to me. Hallelujah. Our king loves worship. Psalms 95 and 6, oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. That's our next point. Praise. Heaven shows us praise to our king. Heaven shows us worship to our king. The next thing is heaven shows us kneeling and bowing before our king. We're going to honor our king. We got to learn how to praise him. We're going to have to learn, do a better job of worshiping. We got to do a better job of bowing before him, kneeling before him. That's an act of humility. When you kneel before a king, you are lowering yourself. You are removing yourself, your head out of the way and letting the king be exalted. You are saying, I'm not worthy, <laughs> but you are. I'm not worthy, but you are, God. We see in heaven, they fell on their faces before the throne. Bowing and kneeling before the Lord is an expression of worship. Now, some people do it because that's what they've been doing all their life, and they've been in traditional church, and they come down, and all the deacons are a certain time of the service, everybody kneels, and they think, okay, let me do this. But where the, the bowing and kneeling really is worship is when God tells you to bow. When he tells you to kneel. Sometimes there have been times when God has told me to bow and kneel in some interesting places where my knees was going to get scraped up. But he just wanted to see if I was going to be obedient. He's not going to ask me to do anything that he doesn't have a blessing connected to it. So when I exalt my knowledge and my understanding over his and say, well, God, I can't do this right now. There's too many people around. Oh, God, I can't do this right now because the, the floor is hard. I'm missing something that he wants to give me. So I have to learn that one way to honor my king is to bow, not when it's comfortable, when I got a pillow or two, but when he tells me to bow, when he tells me to kneel. Because at that moment, he's requiring from me to express my worship to him as my king and my Lord above everything else. In the Hebrew, they regarded knees as a symbol of strength. So to bend your knee is to bend your strength. It's to bend your strength before God, acknowledging <laughs> 
that God, watch this, you are my strength. You see, because part of our problem when it comes to bowing and kneeling, which is the expression of worship, people who are prideful, who are arrogant, who see selfish and, and think the world evolves around them, have a problem bowing and humbling and surrendering and submitting themselves. And so God will test us because we're always talking about God is the, my king. He is my Lord. And then he asks us to kneel and bow. But because we selfish and we're self-centered and we're full of ourselves, we won't do it. And he wants to see, is he your strength? Are you your strength? (laughs) So when I bow, I say, you're my strength, God. All of my gifts and all of my talents and all of the things people, accolades and people pat me on the back and tell me I'm so good at and I do such a a good job at, God, I lay them before you. Because I'm nothing without you. Absolutely nothing without you. I couldn't even tie my shoe or brush my teeth if it wasn't for you. See, bowing or kneeling help us to get our priorities in order. Help us to set our minds right because sometimes we think we're all that. And the world has been telling us, and people, even in our families, have been telling us that ever since we were small, we grow up thinking the world's supposed to center around me. Had the guy one time, he was saying, wow, you do this, you go here, you do this, whatever. That's, that's wonderful. I said, I thank God. He said, stop talking about God. God didn't do that. You did that. You need to, you need to take some kind of praise for yourself and stop trying to give it to God. I looked at him, I shook my head. I said, you just don't know what you're talking about. You just don't understand. Had it not been for the Lord on my side, I wouldn't be here. Had it not been for the Lord who was with me when I should have died, I wouldn't be here. When I should have gotten that car accident, when I should have went off that road, when I should have died because I was bleeding to death in the hospital. If it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, I wouldn't even be standing here today. How dare I feel the nerve to pat myself on the back for anything that God gave me. How dare, how dare, how dare to bow. They fell on their faces in heaven. They didn't even look because of the brilliance of God. He's too great to look upon. Anytime God revealed himself, people fell to their knees. They didn't want to look because of the shame, knowing who they were. Psalm 29 says, ascribe to the Lord the glory that's due his name. (laughs) Ascribe to the Lord the glory that's due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Psalm 66 says, all the earth worships you and sings praises unto your name. Not man's name, your name. So the third thing that heaven shows us about honoring our king is that we have to bow and kneel before him. The fourth thing that heaven shows us is that We are to give sacrifices and gifts. Do you know God keeps a record of the gifts that we give? Heaven keeps a record of the gifts that you give. Heaven keeps a record of the sacrifices that you make. Heaven does that. It keeps a detailed record of everything that you have given. It knows what you haven't given. (laughs) Because giving is important to God. Gifts are a part of worship. As I said earlier when we were talking about earthly kings, you didn't go before a king without a gift in your hand. And how great is our king? You are not truly worshiping unless you are bringing God gifts. I'm going to say that again. You are not truly worshiping unless you are bringing God gifts. Because gifts to God express thankfulness. Gifts express ownership. Who really owns you? Gifts show us (laughs) 
who you really recognize, who you really honor. And if it's a great king, it's going to be costly gifts. Nobody gives cheap gifts to a great king. Well, some people do. Where is your affections? Who is your first love? That's all is, is being spoken when you don't bring a gift or when you minimize the king by giving him a cheap gift. Where is your affection for your king? Where, who is really your first love? Wise men brought gifts to the king when he was a baby. <laughs> The world brought gifts to Solomon. Look, the gift that God gave the 24 elders around his throne, the crowns, every time the four creatures started worshiping him, they laid their crowns and gave them back to God. Because any gift we give to God and any gift he gives to us, it all belongs to him. <laughs> So even the gifts that we're holding on to, whether they be financial gifts or things God's requiring to us, we're holding on to them. We're holding on to things that God gave us to see if he can trust us to give them back to the one they belong to. There was always gifts. Sacrificial offerings were required even back when Cain and Abel were living by the patriarchs in the law. Our lives in the New Testament, our time, our money, our gifts, and we disrespect the king of kings or we treat him with contempt when we don't bring him gifts. I might not get an amen, but I'm going to tell you the truth. The greatest gift that you can give him is a soul. But guess what? If you can't even give them an offering, we know you can't give them a soul. If you can't even give up your best shirt or your, your, your bed, there are people who came to my house, couples, and the Lord was like, give them your room. I mean, I clean my room like I never, I don't even clean it for me like that. I clean it for them. Take out my new sheets, ones that feel so good that I ain't even slept on and put them on the bed because people are coming and I want to present to them the very best. You can take my room, I'll go stay at my sister's, I'll go sleep on the couch bed, whatever, but you take my room. Some of us, watch this, you remember the scripture that said when you do it to the least of these, you did it to me? We always talking about how we will honor our king. If Jesus came, I'll give him whatever he want. No, you won't because you won't even do it for your brother and sister. You won't even do it for your own people in your own church. You won't do it for nobody in your neighborhood. So stop all of this, what you would do if Jesus was here. And when you do it to them, he said, you did it to me. What gifts are you giving to the Lord? The first of everything belonged to the Lord. What opened up the womb was presented to the Lord. What opened up the womb from an animal was presented to the Lord. The first fruits of your harvest that you planted was belonged to the Lord. Everything was given to him first. Why? Because he is the priority. Because he is the king. Isaiah 18 and 7 says, At that time, gifts will be brought to the Lord Almighty. The gifts will be brought to Mount Zion, the place of the name of the Lord Almighty. God wants gifts. I got to get done. Number five, this is going to be different. The fifth thing we learn in heaven is that God wants us to honor him as king with our songs, with our singing. Scripture tells us, sing unto the Lord. What kind of song? Where's that new song coming from? When, Psalm wrote, when David wrote the Psalms, David was a psalmtress. He wrote songs, right? He was talking to the people, telling the people, sing unto the Lord a new song. Well, what if you're not a songwriter? You don't have to be a songwriter. Because, watch this, songs that come from your heart are what the king wants. 
you don't have to sing in A or whatever the key is. You don't have to, to, to put it together like one of your favorite artists. And it's great. I love, we all love singing other people's song. But God wants you to sing a song to him that comes from you. The Bible says in Revelations there are songs that the redeemed Israel, 144,000, are going to learn and sing that nobody else can sing. There are songs God wants to, you to, 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 for you to bring forth. You can just be in worship and praising God and you get a little melody and just sing that to the Lord. Oh, man, the king just loves it when you sing to him. He loves it because singing is like, songs are like poems. Singing is like the expression of your heart. You guys understand this. Anybody ever give somebody a card, a birthday card, an anniversary card, or whatever? It, it, and it's already written. The words are already written, written on, on what it's saying. Beautiful. It rhymes and everything else. But what means the most in those cards is not what was pre-written, but what you write. And so when you sing to the Lord, it's like you signing the card yourself. It's like you telling them from your heart what you think about him. When he opens up the card, he's not looking for what somebody else wrote about him. He's looking for what you wrote about him. And that's what happens when you sing songs. Sing unto the Lord a new song. In heaven, singing is heard. Rejoicing is heard. No one can sing what you sing. No one can sing it how you sing it. So God wants you to sing your own song. Make it your own, your own original. Come up with it. Miriam, when the children of Israel got on the other side of the, of, <laughs> of the Red Sea and they saw all of their enemies drown, Miriam got a tambourine and, and the scriptures write down the song she made up at that moment. Thanking her God. Praising her God. Worshiping her God for the mighty deeds that he had done for his people. Sing to the Lord. A new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all people. Psalms 96. So if you want to honor the king, I dare you to start singing to your king. Give him a song. Give him one verse. Even if it's hallelujah, that's all you can get. Sing a song to him. It honors him. It does something to him. All right, number six. We're almost done. Obedient service. In heaven, this is the pattern. We see there's obedient service by everyone. The service, the angels in heaven, the creature. Everybody receives God's will and does his will. They don't question his will. They don't doubt his will. They don't justify the other actions they make. They don't make excuses. They follow his orders. They just do it. They just do it. Watch this. We're talking about honoring our king. Your delay to do what God told you to do is your disobedience to the king. I'm going to do it, pastor. I'm just waiting for this and that and that. Your delay is your disobedience. When God tells you to do something, you are to do it. That's the biblical pattern. That's heaven's pattern. Every servant understands that. If we're going to honor our king, we're going to obey him. We're going to obey and do what he tells us to do. We're not going to question. We're not going to doubt it. We're not going to make excuses. We're going to do it. Our delay is our disobedience to our king. We are to obey him, not when it's convenient. We're to obey him because we're committed to him. The scripture says, why do you call me Lord, Lord? I'm going to change it today. Why do you call me your king, but you won't do what I say? Why do you keep saying I'm your king, but you won't do what I tell you to do? Tell you to get up her some money, you ain't doing it. Tell you to sow seed here, you ain't doing it. Tell you to help somebody move, you ain't doing it. Tell you to do sing, you ain't doing it. Tell you to help here, you ain't doing it. Why do you call me your king, 
and you won't do anything I ask you to do. Go tell that person you're sorry. I'm not doing it. They started it. Why do you call me your king and you won't do what I ask you to do? Stop being with that person. Stop hanging out with that person. That person's no good for you. You keep doing it. Why do you keep calling me your king and you know what I'm telling you to do, but you won't do it? Last thing, seven. The last thing to honor our king, if we're really talking about we're going to honor our king the way that God intended, heaven shows us this last example, is praying the will of God on the earth. You see, in heaven, there were prayers. There were bowls of incense. There were the prayers of the saints. All, every prayer was in that bowl. Every prayer of the saints on earth who agreed with what God was saying that he wanted to do on the earth was in that bowl. So if we're going to honor our king, (laughs) we've got to pray prayers of agreement with God that he ultimately has spoken that will bring fulfillment to his will on the earth. These right prayers, we got to stop praying these prayers, wait till we get sick, wait till we don't feel well, wait till this is going in our life, wait till our money gets low, and all of a sudden, could, Pastor, could you pray for this? Could you pray for that? Let's start praying for God's will. Let's pray for what he wants to happen on the earth. Let's pray for the souls he wants to bring in. Let's pray for the people he wants to heal. Let's pray for the people he wants to reach. Our, all of our stuff is taken care of. That's the last thing. Romans 12 and 12, be constant in prayer. From 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17, pray without ceasing. Ephesians 6 and 18, pray in the spirit at all times. Philippians 4 and 6, pray about everything. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, pray about everything. Colossians 4 and 2, pray continually. Luke 18, I always, always pray and don't give up. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, ask according to his will and it will be done. Pray everywhere you go, whatever house you're going to, whatever, on the phone call in public pray. God wants us, if you want to honor the king, start praying. Don't limit prayer to Wednesday night. Don't limit prayer to Sunday. Some of y'all already do that already at the restaurant pray. When I talk to people on the phone, the Holy Spirit starts telling me, do not get off the phone with that person until you pray for them. Start asking people, you know what? I noticed that such. Will you allow me to pray with you? Will you allow me to pray for you? If you want to honor the king, start praying for people because your prayers are being heard in heaven and they're being put in a bowl of incense that will ultimately reveal the fulfillment of the will of God on the earth. They're being remembered by God. So we are admonished today by the Holy Spirit what God requires from us as his citizens in the kingdom, as his servants. We are admonished by him of how to honor him, how to honor our king. He's challenging us that as my servants, you can do a better job of honoring that this is a season and a time where I want you to really evaluate whether you honor me as your king the way that you say you do. Stand to your feet.